Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Let's go over to the CBN newsroom for today's top stories. Gordon, with Tropical Storm Elsa barreling toward Florida, crews overnight demolished the remaining structure of the partially collapsed condo building in the town of Surfside. And then rescuers were given the all clear to resume work looking for possible survivors. Dale Hurd has the story. After a series of controlled explosions, the remaining portion of the building came crashing down Sunday night at 10.30 p.m. local time. The blast was designed to fall away from the existing rubble to give search and rescue crews additional room to look for the 121 people still missing after part of the building collapsed June 24th. Gravity will pull it almost straight, everything straight down, but it will have a little tilt to it where the material wants to stay away from the collapsed part so they can continue their recovery. Officials wanted to bring down the remaining structure before any impacts from Tropical Storm Elsa are felt in the area. Now the impacts from the storm, whether it's a strong tropical storm or a weak hurricane, uh, will begin affecting the Florida Keys and portions of the South Florida Peninsula as early as Monday. So we're preparing for the risk of isolated tornadoes, storm surge, heavy rainfall, and flash flooding. Earlier Sunday, officials searched for any pets left in the building. As officials acknowledge the odds of finding survivors are dwindling. An Israeli search and rescue operations expert told a Miami TV station he no longer believes there are any survivors under the rubble. The circumstances as we saw in the last few days are too difficult for me to say professionally that I believe that there is a solid chance to find somebody alive. This local resident complained the rescue and demolition process has been too slow. It shouldn't be weeks to do something. Uh, you got to cut red tape right away. And it shouldn't have taken the storm because we have our rescue workers there and it, and it was shifting. Fourth of July fireworks in Miami Beach were canceled this weekend as the area instead honored the victims and first responders. Dale Hurd, CBN News. As we mentioned, Tropical Storm Elsa is heading toward Florida, and it's already hit several island nations in the Eastern Caribbean, killing at least three people. And Sunday, Cuba evacuated 180,000 people amid fears that the storm could cause heavy flooding. People took refuge with relatives in government shelters, and those in mountainous areas went to caves. The storm had maximum sustained winds of about 60 miles an hour, and it's expected to gradually weaken while moving across Cuba today. Former President Donald Trump's team launched a new social media website and platform on Independence Day. It's called Getter. It comes from the words getting together. The team calls it an alternative to big tech sites. The platform's mission statement says it is fighting cancel culture, promoting common sense, defending free speech, challenging social media monopolies, and creating a true marketplace of ideas. The site will be open to people of all political beliefs from around the world. Conservatives and Christians have complained about censorship by big tech social media websites. And that's a major problem because free speech is one of the key institutions of America ever since its independence. And some worry the alleged online censorship could even affect elections. But one leading constitutional expert, law professor and author Alan Dershowitz told CBN News, the battle can still be won. From a sitting U.S. president to average Americans voicing their opinions about COVID-19 origins, masking and vaccines. It seems if you share an opinion that doesn't support a progressive narrative, you'll be censored, maybe even banned from social media platforms. The Nazis burned books. Lenin, Stalin, and Mao silenced those who expressed views in opposition to the government. Is this new censorship reminiscent of those one-party totalitarian states? Former Harvard Law professor and legal analyst Alan Dershowitz is author of the book, The Case Against the New Censorship, Protecting Free Speech from Big Tech, Progressives, and Universities. What has this in common? Uh, the people who burned the books in Nazi Germany were students. Uh, the people who advocated communism in Lenin and Stalin's Russia were students. Um, the millennials today are on the forefront of censorship. They think they have the truth and they don't need dissent, they don't need due process. Why bother with dissenting views or free speech if they know what the truth is? We're not in Nazi Germany, we're not in Stalin's Russia, but we are uh, getting close to situations 
where uh, non-government officials, and that's what's so dangerous, non-government officials, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, uh, YouTube, are determining what we can hear, what we can say. You know, the First Amendment has two aspects, the right of the speaker to speak, but the right of the audience to listen. Dershowitz, a constitutional law expert, says the American audience is being deprived of listening to divergent views. Case in point, says Dershowitz, a debate between him and Congressman Bobby Kennedy Jr. about COVID-19 vaccinations. Kennedy is opposed to COVID-19 vaccinations. Dershowitz supports them. Their video debate was censored by YouTube. Most likely, YouTube took the action because of the anti-vaccination views of Congressman Kennedy. YouTube says it, quote, doesn't allow content that spreads medical misinformation, that contradicts local health authorities or the World Health Organization's medical information about COVID-19. They said vaccination is not a debatable issue. We don't want to hear two sides of it, and we don't want our audience to hear two sides of it. So hundreds of thousands of people were denied the right to hear me and Bobby Kennedy debate this issue. I won the debate by default. I don't want to win the debate by default. I want to win the debate on the merits in the marketplace of ideas. And this new censorship may even influence elections. Last fall, just prior to the presidential vote, the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop and money transfers from China and Ukraine was banned on social media. It was ignored or played down by some members of the mainstream media. So how worrisome is that type of censorship influencing election outcomes by preventing all factual information from being made public? It's very dangerous because it not only prevents that or has interference with that, but on so many other aspects of, of life, on whether to take a vaccination uh, or not, on uh, other issues. The head of the little town of Brooklyn Center uh, said that he thought that the woman police officer who pulled out her gun instead of her taser and thought she was firing the taser, yelling, taser, 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 when she was indicted for manslaughter, the, the town guy said she ought to be given due process, and he was immediately fired for calling for a constitutional right, due process for every citizen. You get fired, and there were threats, and if they didn't fire him, there would be all kinds of repercussions. Uh, that's the problem that's going on in America today. And it's not only big tech. Colleges and universities are also censoring speech. Dershowitz says he was dismayed when Harvard University fired one of his former colleagues. Professor Ron Sullivan was the first African-American to ever be made a dean of a Harvard college. He was a great dean, and then he made the, quote, mistake of defending Harvey Weinstein for about a month on constitutional issues. And the students in his college said they felt unsafe. They didn't feel unsafe when a year earlier he defended somebody accused of a double murder, but they felt unsafe because he was representing somebody who they didn't like and who had been accused of sexual misconduct. So he got fired by Harvard University um, for who he represented. If John Adams had been a professor at Harvard back in 1771, he'd have been fired, I guess, for representing the Boston Massacre soldiers. And Abraham Lincoln would have been fired because he represented some disreputable characters and great people in America have represented awful people. So what can be done to reverse this trend? Is it too late? Well, it's not too late. We write books, as I do. We have talk shows like you do. And um, we try to appeal directly to the American public. Then we go to the Supreme Court. We have legislation which could restrict the, freedom to the ability of um, social media to take advantage of Section 230, which exempts them from lawsuits if they continue to censor speech. So a lot of things we can do. We haven't lost this battle, um, and it's part of a bigger war. And look, I lived through McCarthyism as a student in college. We overcame that. I think we'll overcome this. Gary Lane, CBN News. Americans marked their 245th Independence Day in style Sunday with fireworks after virtually all of the celebrations were canceled last year because of COVID-19. In Washington, D.C., fireworks exploded, as you see there, over the Jefferson Memorial and other historic locations. In New York, beautiful displays lit up the night skies over the financial capital of the world and more fireworks in other cities across the country, including Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and more, as the country took another major step after such a difficult year in 2020. 
When the leaders of the American colonies came together before the Revolutionary War to discuss their fight for independence against their British overlords, their first business wasn't war, it was prayer. Paul Strand tells us about their first gathering in Philadelphia and how it was under God. Feeling the lash of British oppression, colonial representatives first met at Philadelphia's Carpenters Hall in 1774. But no one was sure how to begin a Continental Congress. Firebrand Samuel Adams jumped in with a controversial proposal. So let's open in prayer. Isn't that amazing? America is opened up with a proposal for prayer, and it begins with a debate over prayer. We can't pray. Because historian Peter Lilback points out they were Catholics, or Protestants from a wide array of denominations. They never prayed together. They all thought they were from different religions. They thought we're biblical or we're true and they're not. Adams was a Congregationalist, basically a Puritan like those who under Oliver Cromwell fought a vicious civil war against England's Anglicans. And the Puritans had chopped off the head of the head of the Anglican Church. He's called Charles I the King. But Adams made a revolutionary statement. I can pray with any man who loves his God and loves his country. So here he is a Congregationalist. And he says, I hear there's just such a man over in that church over there, the Anglican church. He proposed its pastor, Jacob Duche, open the Congress in prayer. It was at that moment that Samuel Adams created the American ecumenical spirit, where in the public square we can walk over our denominational boundaries. Literally, if you will, he stepped over the aisle. Duche came, but all dressed up in fancy priestly robes. He came in his full pontificals, which meant he was really decked out with the very things that Puritans hated. He held the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which Puritans loathed. But then Duche began the reading set long ago for that day in the book. With a possible war looming, the Congress felt it was a totally prophetic moment as the reading was from Psalm 35 about being loyal to an elder who suddenly betrays. That we had been loyal to the mother country and they're turning against us and harming us. It started out, fight against them that fight against me. John Adams wrote his wife. So you would have thought in God's providence that was put into the Book of Common Prayer just for this day for us. Duche's prayer then asked God for freedom from the rod of America's oppressor and ended in the name of Jesus Christ. It's quite a remarkable moment that that's where the American story began. In prayer, as opposite sides came together for a greater good in the name of Christ. Paul Strand, CBN News, Carpenters Hall, Philadelphia. Well, not on my watch. That's what President Trump tweeted about cutting funding for Stars and Stripes. It's been the newspaper of record for the U.S. military for more than a century. And people have died delivering this paper to the troops. Well, now a filmmaker hopes his documentary on Stars and Stripes will become a call to action. Eric Phillips explains. When Stephen Barber first came up with the idea for his film, The World's Most Dangerous Paper Route, he believed it would be wildly popular, especially among service members worldwide. He did not expect it to play a role in keeping the newspaper's presses printing. This is their hometown paper away from home. It's about being connected to home because a lot of times these guys, once they're gone, they're gone and they don't, they can't make phone calls. They can't send emails. And the only thing they have is the Stars and Stripes. Stephen Barber has made several military themed films, but admits this one is his favorite. I've seen this movie 10 times. Told in documentary style, the world's most dangerous paper route focuses on the 150-year-old Stars and Stripes. Getting stories from the battlefield can be harrowing, even deadly. A lot of journalists have been killed in these wars. Something former reporter Linda Rausch knows all too well. When you, you know, when you see that, you're sorry, God. It's just hard for me to go back. Every single day, the paper is distributed to U.S. military installations. The Stars and Stripes paper route is uh, all over the Middle East. Kuwait, Iraq, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. Hence the title of the film, suggested to Barber by one of the paper's reporters. And he just looked at me and he said, I got the great, great title, Mike. We'll call it the world's most dangerous paper route. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, I, I, I'd love to tell you that I came up with the title, but I didn't. And, it's, it, and that was what really blew my mind was it's not very often you get a title that draws you in immediately. Little did Barber know that during production, the Defense Department would plan to stop publishing the paper, moving its $15 million budget to other areas. 
A group of bipartisan lawmakers lobbied to stop it, however, including Senator Lindsey Graham. But when I went to Germany, it was a big deal when the paper came. When you're in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was a really huge deal. And he told me, you know, when I interviewed him a couple years ago, there's no way that this paper is ever going down. Not on my watch. I won't let it happen. Lindsey Graham got it to the White House. The president saw it. And that led to a presidential tweet that said, the United States of America will not be cutting funding to Stars and Stripes magazine under my watch. It will continue to be a wonderful source of information to our great military. The Pentagon rescinded its order to stop the presses. You know, because anybody who would watch the film, there's no way they'd shut this newspaper down. People have died delivering this paper to the troops. That, that's, I, I don't think any other publication in the world can say that. And a movie is like a cake. You know, you put in the flour, you put in the sugar, you put in the baking powder, and it doesn't always rise. But in this particular case, this film rose to the occasion. Though the paper is still being published for now, the question over its funding remains. Lawmakers have indicated Congress may directly fund the paper, though that line was not included in its initial budget. The world's most dangerous paper route is available on Amazon Prime. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, all of the Stars and Stripes is part of the Department of Defense budget and also must earn most of its operating budget. And that's what helps keep the paper independent and then free from censorship. If you want to support the mission of Stars and Stripes, all you have to do is go to CBNNews.com and we'll give you a link to the paper. Louis Medina could buy whatever he wanted. And what he wanted was luxury cars, lots of them. Ultimately, the spending caught up with him, and he couldn't keep up with the bills. Then Lewis was blindsided by something he never saw coming. Well, what was it? Take a look. So it was when I was interviewing for a project, the owner of the business said, you're like a red Ferrari on the highway. You can write your own ticket. You can write your own pass. Louis Medina was a successful self-taught IT contractor. He made six figures and bought everything he, his wife Yvette, and two children wanted. It felt really good knowing that I could go anywhere with the indus in the industry. And so I began to buy cars, BMWs, uh, every model you can imagine back then I bought. My wife had Mercedes, uh, Mercedes and Infiniti, and I got caught up in, um, in my job. I, at the same time, we were slowly drifting away from the church. Spending got even more out of hand when the couple, on the advice of a bank representative, switched from using cash to credit cards. And the gentleman, in order to build credit, you need to have a credit card, and then that we max that credit card out. Well, we'll get another one. Ultimately, the Medinas couldn't keep up with their monthly bills. And I was always thinking, geez, why he makes such good money? Why are we always, it seems like we're, we never end up with anything. We weren't good stewards of our money. It's like a sewer pipe. If you're not careful, it, it, it starts to leak, but eventually it's just going to bust. And then it's going to seep into everything, even my health. Lewis was diagnosed with stage four liver cirrhosis. It shocked him since he worked out and didn't drink alcohol. Doctors said all of his organs would likely shut down and he'd die. The couple drained all of their savings and still ended up with over $84,000 of debt. It was a wake-up call for both Lewis and Yvette. I said, I'm about to potentially face a, a holy God. And uh, there was shame, you know? I felt like I hadn't lived up to who I should have been uh, as a believer. I had my moments where I was just like, God, I want my husband. I wanted to grow old with him. Lewis has always been the provider, but God gave me like a peace. It's like he reminded me, Lewis isn't your provider. I'm your provider. So during this crisis, the couple stopped putting their confidence in paychecks and their possessions and chose to return to God, to church, and to tithing. It brought us to a point where it was just, I surrender my pride. I, I surrender my money. It's not my money to begin with, it's yours. We just began to study his word and stand on his promises. And tithing was just, we just did that out of obedience. The focus wasn't on how we were gonna make the money. It was just depending on God. Man, we just began to see God's hand move. 
Lewis underwent 35 surgeries in 15 months. The Medinas continued giving throughout that time, and Lewis eventually recovered from his sickness, allowing him to once again enjoy life with Yvette and their grown kids. Then, within a year and a half, they paid off their $84,000 debt. I could finally put on that spreadsheet, paid in full for all of our accounts. We cut up the credit cards. The hospital forgave a big portion of their medical bills, and Lewis started a family-owned IT business with his son that's been doing well even during the coronavirus pandemic. It feels so liberating. We have our priorities straight now. Number one is God. Now, instead of buying things for themselves, they prefer to give to others through ministries like CBN. We love donating to orphans and widows. You look at people differently. There's so much love. It's not about you. It's like, what can I do for somebody else? Life does not consist of the abundance and the things uh, that you possess. And that peace, I thought I could get with another 740 or a Mercedes. You just can't buy it. It's, it's, it's from God. It's something I learned from my father a long time ago, that the purpose of money is to give us the ability to help other people. It's to give us the ability to preach the gospel around the world. It's, it's, it's all about that. If it becomes about our consumption and, and somehow we feel better by having the bigger car or the bigger whatever, um, no, it's not that. And it follows what Paul instructed Timothy. Here you find it in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Tell those who are rich not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. But their pride and trust should be in the living God, who always richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. You saw the change in Lewis, how God transformed his heart. And he goes from debt, he goes from poverty into a, a, a wonderful, happy life, all because he made a decision that I will give. I will give to others. I will help others in need. I will use what God gives to me, and I will use that to help others. When you have that attitude, when you have that joyous generosity, God loves a cheerful giver. Wonderful things can happen. You'll be put in relationship. Your heart will be filled with love. Your life will be filled with joy. If you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to start a life of giving, and not a one-time thing, but I want to do this on a regular basis. Now, when you give to the 700 Club, realize you're helping people around the world. You're also preaching the gospel around the world. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to do just those things. We want to see the gospel go around the world, and we want to help people here at home and around the world. And you're a part of all of it when you join. How much is it? It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at 700 Club Gold. That's $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, and you know that bank's going to take care of everything. Your gift is going to come every single month. When you join Pledge Express, we send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call or when you go to the donation page of CBN.com and you give monthly, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Once again, Chick-fil-A has earned the top spot as America's favorite fast food chain for the seventh year in a row. That's according to the recent survey from the American Customer Satisfaction Index. The survey measures things like order accuracy, food quality, cleanliness of the facility, mobile ordering, and the helpfulness of the staff. 
The top 10 were Chick-fil-A, Domino's, KFC, Starbucks, Five Guys, Panera Bread, Pizza Hut, Arby's, Chipotle, Mexican Grill, and Dunkin'. CBN's Superbook is hosting events with different communities across Honduras in partnership with Operation Blessing. During each Superbook event, children are able to watch an episode together as well as take part in fun activities in a local school. Teachers also share hygiene practices to inform children how to stay safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. The children also take time to memorize scripture by saying the Superverse out loud together and they learn about God's love. During these events, the children also give their life to Jesus and say the salvation prayer with teachers. Boy, that's wonderful to hear about. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. James' story went in and out of consciousness as COVID-19 ravaged his body. His condition was so dire, doctors were considering a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. Then James had a vision that he was already in the grave. What happened next? And how did it lead to a miracle? Watch. The first time I heard about COVID, we were in a staff meeting at church at Gallatin First United Methodist Church in Gallatin, Tennessee. The administration from the bishop's office had sent down uh, some recommendations of how to prepare uh, for this pandemic that we were about to experience. James Story, a retired high school and college music professor in Tennessee, began feeling ill in March of 2020. I started to have chills and fever, and I had gone to the emergency room and they had sent me home. But, but over the weekend, I had gotten worse. Uh, I went to my regular PC and uh, he did some blood work. Of course, there was no mark at that point in time to to distinguish that you have COVID at this point in time. He called and asked me if I could take him to the hospital, to the ER, so the doctors, his blood work had come back and the doctors wanted to um, him to go to the ER. We didn't know what was gonna happen. I was getting the calls every day and I was seeing what was going on with his vitals and, and everything that was going, long, going wrong with him. So uh, yeah, it was scary. I had become a septic, I had, uh, started dialysis because the kidneys were failing. And uh, from there, uh, it was pretty much downhill. James spent several weeks going in and out of consciousness as his condition worsened. He was on a ventilator for 15 days. He required um, beginning hemodialysis because his kidneys stopped working. Um, so his COVID case would have been considered a severe case of COVID-19. James' friends set up a Facebook page and began a prayer vigil for him. Meanwhile, James decided to use this time to grow spiritually. I took advantage of the time that I had a way to meditate and read scriptures and become closer to God. At one point, James saw a vision. I felt like I was in a grave and uh, a grave, and I was trying to pull myself up uh, to, to the sunlight. I felt as though I saw the face of God and he was reaching out his hand to me. And all I could do was bow down and worship. My friends, my church members, my family, and people around the world were praying for me. There were a few days where, you know, we wondered if we were going to be able to wean him from the ventilator or if his family was going to have to make a decision regarding um, considering a tracheostomy, uh, feeding tube, things of that nature. Several months before, James had written a song for his deceased sister that he says actually helped sustain him. Our pastor James Johnson had used as our mission statement, the love now, let us love not only in words and deeds, but in truth and action. So I set up my piano and using the mission statement of love now, the song wrote itself. There were times that I was fighting, uh, not wanting to have the vent taken out. But over a series of few days that song was playing, I finally calmed down and they were able to remove the ventilation and I was breathing pretty much on my own. How could I have known that that song written for my sister would be part of the miraculous healing for me? 
James began to turn the corner. He was taken off the ventilator, his kidneys began functioning better, and he was transferred to another facility. In all, he had been hospitalized for 71 days. I truly believe that prayer was part of it. Every Wednesday night, we did that at 7 o'clock because that was our choir practice time. So, yeah, I believe it was truly a part of it, of his healing. Since James was released from Hendersonville TriStar Hospital, he has made a near full recovery. I'm just um, overcome with joy in his recovery. You know, he could have, he could have died, um, and I think that, um, you know, God spared him, and he's just a wonderful success story to, you know, um, his faith, and also, you know, the excellent health care that he received. There was a group of choir members and some of his friends that had gathered, and they were singing a happy day. So I think there couldn't have been a more appropriate song for that day, because it was a happy day. Not only is there a miracle that happened to me, there is a miracle within every one of us if we seek and find. I know it was his healing grace and power that gave me a second chance. I don't consider myself lucky, but I consider myself blessed. Boy, you just rejoice with him, don't you, as you listen to the story of what James went through. I mean, that was a lot. I love the part of his vision where he said, God was reaching down toward me, and all I could do was bow down before him, because the power of God is beyond our understanding, really. But he has the power to touch us right at our point of need. He has the power. Scripture says he reaches down and lifts us up, sets our feet on a rock, pulls us out of the miry pit, gives us hope in the future, gives us life in James' scenario. You know, we all have needs, and I know many of you watch this program specifically for this point in time where we pray together, where we commit to you to stand with you in whatever your need is, and where we ask God to hear us all as we come before him and as we bow down and worship who he is. So we want to take some time to pray for you today and to encourage you in your faith. If James' story hasn't done it, we've got a couple of others here to share with you. Gordon, this is Duncan, who lives in Bellevue, Nebraska, clearly remembers the day in 1965 when he seriously injured his shoulder. More than 50 years later, he was still in agonizing pain. He was watching this program and he heard you, Gordon, describe his injury and proclaim God's healing during prayer. So Duncan stood with you in that, claimed his um, healing. Today, after 50 years, he's pain-free and giving God all the glory. Well, praise God. Here's Linda from North, uh, from North Carolina. She had two very serious conditions which brought her to tremendous pain, discomfort. Her doctors did all they could, uh, but they couldn't heal her. And so Linda learned to live with chronic symptoms. She was watching the 700 Club. Terry, you said, someone named Linda called her by name. I don't know your condition, but this is what I feel you are to know. You've been diagnosed with some serious things, and you have accepted it as part of life. God is healing your condition right now. You are being made completely whole, and everything bothering you is healed now, well, Linda believed, was healed, and her doctor has confirmed her healing. Praise God. Wow. Wow. These are wonderful miracles because it's a wonderful God. Mm. Now, ask yourself this question. How does faith work? How does it work? Well, the Bible is very clear. It works through love. And you saw in James' story how, how much he dwelt on love, how, how he sang about it how his church community surrounded him with love to let him know that they were there with him. They were going to go through it with him. You heard it from the doctors, uh, from all the medical professionals, professionals who surrounded him. They surrounded him with love. In that environment, faith works. Faith works through love. So right now, ask for the love of God to surround you. When you have that, you know how much he cares for you. And faith becomes very easy in that environment. You know that you don't have to bargain. You don't have to beg. You, don't, you just have to receive. 
You have to receive what he's already done. Now, this is love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means he died for you, even when you were alienated from him in your own heart. Leave all that alienation. Turn your thinking to the love of God, how his love was poured out for you as his blood was poured out for you. His love is all around you. Let it be in you. Let it be in your every breath, your every thought. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let's pray, let's believe, and let's let God's love do all the rest. Lord, we just come to you, and we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you took all our sin. You, you, you've forgiven all our trans transgressions. While we were alienated from you, you made a way back. So we turn, and we're reconciled to you. We, we want to be in your presence. We want to feel your love, your overwhelming, overflowing love. Pour it out on us, Lord God. Let us dwell in it. Let us know the greatness of your love. Be with us now. And now in your love, we reach out. We ask for those who are injured. We ask for those who have chronic illness. We ask for all those who are having difficulty breathing. We ask for everyone who is sick, who has any kind of infirmity. We bring them to you and we lay them at your feet and we ask for them to be healed. Stretch forth your hand to do miracles now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, someone, um, you have a, I don't know if the hemorrhaging has started or there's a fear of hemorrhaging in the back of your eye and the loss of your eyesight. God is stopping that right now. Whatever the condition is that's causing all of this concern and the potential diagnosis, God is stopping that. Your sight is being restored to you. Receive it in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone named Mary. You've been praying for a child, and the, the picture I have is that you have your left hand under the child's head and shoulders, neck, and uh, the other hand under their legs, and you've been literally lifting them to God, asking for healing for your baby. God is healing right now. He's answering that prayer right now in Jesus' name. Your child will be restored, will be completely healed. Just receive it, believe it in Jesus' name. Um, there's someone else you've sustained a, an unusual fracture um, uh, above your, your eye, and it goes into your forehead, God's going to knit that bone together properly. And all the pain, all the discomfort is going to be leaving you right now. In Jesus' name, just receive that, believe that, receive it, and experience His healing touch right now. That pain's leaving you. It's going away now. In Jesus' name. There's someone else you've been experiencing for a long time, hostility in your family. Um, you'll know this is you because earlier this week, you came across the scripture where it says, before we come to him for anything, if we have ought against any, go back and resolve that. God is going to open some doors for you to walk through to, reser to resolve the hostility in your family. Don't be afraid to walk through that door. He's going to give you all the wisdom, all the words, all the, the peace of heart and peace of mind. Do what he leads you to do in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the healer. You are the Savior. You are our peace. And Lord, let your love dwell in us. Let it be in us. Let every word that comes from us be spoken in love, in your anointing, in your spirit. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. We'd love to share the story of what God is doing in the world today. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, 
We absolutely believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't rest until it gets an answer. If you want us to stand with you in prayer, we're here. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Well, it's time for some questions and honest answers. Gordon, this first one comes from Greg, who says, I have a question for Gordon. It seems as if in the New Testament, when Jesus quotes scripture, he mainly quotes the Greek translation of the texts instead of the Hebrew versions. Why, especially when speaking to Jewish followers? And if Jesus co quoted the Septuagint, couldn't we base our Old Testament translations off of this instead of off the, off the <laughs> Masoretic text? <laughs> Text. Hello. Greg, that's a, yeah. that's a theology, theology <laughs> seminary question. Um, uh, let me give you the short answer. The Greek writers uh, of the New Testament, there, there's some indication that Matthew may have been written in Hebrew, but uh, the other Gospels were, were all written in Greek, including uh, the Gospel of John, because that was the Greek-speaking world. That was the language of the world in the first century. And so they're doing it in order to communicate effectively with the audience who is receiving it. The primary text for the Old Testament, even in Israel in the first century, was the Septuagint. It was the Greek text because that was the one that they read. Uh, so when the Greek writers of the Greek New Testament are, are using quotes from the Old Testament, they're using quotes from the Septuagint. Now, a wonderful thing happened, and it's called the Renaissance. <laughs> in the Renaissance, people got the idea, we need to go back to the original text. They had been using Jerome's Vulgate, and Jerome was a great scholar, but uh, frankly, his Greek translation into Latin has some flaws in it, as well as his uh, translation from Hebrew into Latin had flaws in it. And there was a uh, drive, let's go back to the original text. That in turn launched the Reformation. When people started reading uh, in the monasteries, they were learning uh, Greek primarily, but some also were learning Hebrew. Um, they came to the conclusion, well, we've got this thing wrong. Uh, there's great freedom, there's great liberty here. Uh, let's go back to the original language, the original intent. Let's have that be our drive. And the wonderful thing for all us Protestants is that we have these wonderful translations. And now there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, but we look back to the original text, and that has been the drive since the Renaissance. Go back to what was originally written as the earliest versions you can find. And let's use those as our inspiration. Now, if you want to read the Septuagint, it's available. It's wonderful. Uh, we have all these things available, wonderful translations. I encourage people, read them all, uh, but primarily read the original if you can. Here's a word from Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 